We are in a desperate, desperate situation right now um, with climate change. And there is essentially nothing we can do about it. So that's what's really sad. Um, there's nothing we can do about it. It's all of the feedback loops are in place, a dozen or more feedback loops that are self-reinforcing. So as ice melts, there's more water exposed, there's more incoming um, heat to be absorbed or solar radiation to be absorbed, causing the water temperature to rise faster, causing the ice to melt, feedback loops, right? So there are all these feedback loops and it's just a question of when. Earth is losing the ability to support complex life. Okay, we're seeing an ominous erosion of our planet's life support systems across the board. You state repeatedly that we are stealing from the future. What is the nature of this theft? Resources that we use today, since uh, they include uh, a preponderance of non-renewable resources, are resources that will be unavailable to posterity. That's the sense in which we're stealing directly from the future. We're also, by changing the conditions of life inadvertently through our waste disposal and so on, uh, making um, areas that were marvelously habitable and uh, pristine, aesthetically pleasing and so on, much less pleasing for posterity. So posterity will not have some of the opportunities that we've taken for granted. You see uh, so many narratives uh, these days. It's sort of compelling, uh, almost uh, fictional narratives describing our portending doom. It sells, uh, we call it climate doom porn. Uh, I think people uh, read it, 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 it sort of um, almost provides uh, adrenaline, the same adrenaline you get from watching an action disaster film. Uh, and so it's unfortunate that it's become so prevalent because so many of these doomless narratives are based on a distortion of the science that's really as bad as the distortions of the science that we're used to seeing from climate change deniers. So it's bad science uh, claims that uh, we're already committed to runaway warming and uh, all of humanity will be wiped out within 10 years. And there are prominent actors in this space who, who make that specific claim. Um, that potentially leads us down the same path of inaction as outright denial. If we don't believe there's any agency, if we don't believe we can do anything about the problem, then why bother? The science tells us that we can. On being a doomer. Let's start with the obvious. The word doomer is a word with horribly dark connotations. The obvious interpretation is that a doomer believes life is hopeless. They might as well give up trying. There's no value to being alive. But that is emphatically not the doomer's perspective. Doomers understand that life is a terminal disease for all of us. That any objective examination of one's life should include the inevitability of death. Yet, even with this universal existential dilemma, doomers still enjoy sunsets and friends. They work towards goals, they have families, they celebrate births and mourn deaths, and they struggle on. Most of all, doomers recognize that humanity has a collective terminal illness here and now, and not at some unimagined future time. Doomers do not believe climate change is gonna end well for the natural world or for humanity. Doomers are saddened by the innumerable losses that are taking place in the natural world, including plants, animals, oceans, ice, and ancient physical processes. Doomers are saddened by losing all the achievements of humanity, including art, literature, science, and philosophy, the totality of humanity's legacy. Doomers are saddened by the human suffering already taking place and the massive suffering of all species, plant and animal.
Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Environmental Coffee House. I see that you've all joined us, and I am with Professor Elliot Jacobson. Hi, Elliot. I Hi, am, Sandy. Oh, I'm so excited. Guys, this is real. No, his voice doesn't sound like that. Already, we have a comedian out there. No, I sped it right. up for the video, silly guy. No, no I he really doesn't. speak like this. <laughs> No, that you guys know I'm creative. All right. Anyway, I just want to give you a little uh, primer on how I found Elliot. And uh, really quick, I'll just show you uh, his Twitter. Found him on Twitter. And I am in the, the little uh, climate change, you know, community on Twitter, Doomer community or scientist community, whatever. And uh, there he was, the new guy. The new kid on the block, but oh, what a new kid. So welcome, Elliot. I want to hear all about you. How in the world did a mathematics professor who is a person that studied risk in the gambling world become a doomer? Yeah, no, that's a really excellent question. I'm going to give you the short version. It happened when I, I had a public television show that I created um, after I retired called um, OK, OK Boomer. I wanted to say OK Doomer, OK <laughs> Boomer. And I would have kids on my show um, who were in the 20 to 25 age range. Um, and I called it cross-generational conversation. So I had a show much like yours right here where I was interviewing people and it would go okay. be broadcast locally in Santa Barbara. And one of the questions I would always ask these kids is, where do you see yourself when you're my age? And um, one of the uh, guests just said, well, I don't think I'll be alive in 15 years. And that was kind of the moment where it kind of blew me away, right? Because I had this really young, healthy, aware, intelligent person tell me they didn't think they were going to be here in 15 years. Wow. Um, so I, I went online and started looking up near-term human extinction and, of course, found my way immediately to Guy McPherson, who is um, sort of the master of that particular domain. Uh, um, didn't we all? And <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. watched absolutely everything he ever <laughs> said and did, right? Every, yeah. absolutely everything. Um, and that sort of got me started. So that was several years ago. Um, the reason I'm new, you haven't heard my voice before here, is I actually volunteered for the local police department here over the last several years. I uh, was a member of what's called Where's the here? Volunteers. Here is Santa Barbara, California. Okay. Um, Let's so I was in what was called the Volunteers in Police. So I was actually a uniformed volunteer officer with okay. the police. And I'm not sure how that'll go over with your audience. He's but... one of them. Oh, my God. A law enforcement but, tumor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the things I do is sign a um, sort of a an agreement that I wouldn't embarrass the department or the city or disparage, you know. And so saying all this um, nasty uh, crappy stuff about people that and the world and what's going to happen is something that absolutely had no place while I had that volunteer position. Oh, no. So, so I I quit that position in June of last year, basically because I don't like authority and I had issues with authority. And <laughs> don't uh, we all? Yeah. And uh, ever since then, I've just been saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna finally st start saying the stuff I want to say. So that's kind of the long, short story. Well, we are really glad because your writing is amazing. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background, your academic background, and uh, your mathematics background, which actually really gives you an edge on a lot of us. Um, well, I was a professor of mathematics, PhD from the University of Arizona, um, and then I was in Ohio at Ohio University until 1997. I had a lot of issues with authority there as well. Uh, I ended up being a whistleblower and having my contract, my tenure bought out there. Mm -hmm. And I was deciding what else can I do with my life? And I thought, well, I'm good at math. Maybe I should try my hand at gambling professionally. 
And so um, I ended up moving to Santa Barbara. It was close to where my family is. I got a walk-on job as a visiting associate professor of computer science at UC Santa Barbara, which is like a dream job, quite honestly. Um, and it was close enough to Las Vegas that I started being able to make a lot of trips there. Um, and over a while, it turned out that I was much better from sort of the math analysis end of it than I was at the playing end of it. I just, I just didn't like the casino environment, the smoke, the noise, all the, you know, but I, I love, I love the math analysis. So okay. I got into that and essentially what I did, um, for many, many years was to create casino games. I did the math for slot machines and table games and that sort of thing. And then eventually I learned about, uh, I decided to figure out how to beat every game and uh, in as many different ways as possible. And so I wrote sort of a, the definitive book on how to no how to beat every casino game in as many ways as possible. No kidding. Um, oh my God, that gets an applause. Yay. <laughs> Look at that. So, so, you know, this book kind of got me worldwide recognition. Um, I was supposed to get a Lifetime Achievement Award by the, uh, by the casino industry in 2020, but the conference got canceled. It got oh, rescheduled yeah. to 2022 February, like a couple weeks from now. But I have a feeling it's going to be canceled again. Oh, but somewhere I'm getting a Lifetime Achievement Award essentially for this work right here in the casino industry. So I just have this ability to do risk modeling, to understand risk, to understand how to uh, program risk and, and um, assess other people's analysis of risk, I think from a very unique perspective from the casino and gambling world. I would say so. I mean, I, when I read your whole background, I have to say I was surprised, but, but yet it made sense with the modeling. And then after I watched your videos and I realized, wow, you know, you have something that really you can add to this, the arena, you know, to our arena, you understand and uh, understand the intricacies of statistical analysis. And it's, you know, not easy for everyone. I did statistical analysis myself in my career yeah. as an HR director. Yeah. You know, I had to analyze affirmative action plan every year, but it's a completely different kind. But, uh, well, go on, tell us more, tell us more. Well, I just, I just want to make one, one small point. I, I love Paul Beckwith. He's like one of my heroes in this business, but he always talks about the climate casino. And yes, I always does. feel like, Hey, that's mine. <laughs> you can't, that's me. I want the climate casino. Um, so I actually wrote an article about that. It's on my, my blog, but, um, so what else I retired, um, and, um, just started, you know, sort of obsessing about climate stuff, um, over the last two, two and a half years, but I've just started writing about it recently. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm so appreciative that people have had such a warm reaction to what I've been writing. Um, oh, I, your writing I took a, is great. I, I took a deep dive into Jim Bendel and into Catherine Ingram, um, you know, and, and um, love Sam Mitchell, love uh, Beckwith, you know, and watch every single bit of that I can, you know, catch all the episodes. I try and follow Michael Mann as best as I can, but he blocked me on Twitter, so I can't <laughs> <laughs> really... That's okay, yeah. because this isn't exactly not the Michael Mann fan club here. I mean, we have a lot of, you know, healthy respect, but uh, I'm yeah. surprised I'm not blocked yet. But uh, hey, it, it, you know, when people say you get blocked by Michael Mann, you should be proud of yourself. <laughs> so you were blocked I, you could, by you Michael could, Mann. <laughs> you could get blocked. Here's how you get blocked by him. You just do like the at Michael E. Mann, and you yeah. just say, I'm a doomer. <laughs> One tweet, I'm a doomer. Done. Oh, wow. That's good. That's good. That's really good. Well, listen, what I wanted to do was um, get into some meat and potatoes here. Uh, get back, back to us. And I, I do have some things. I, I do have one quote I wanted to put up. And I thought that this was quite uh, salient for the discussion. I had, uh, if I can find it now, here we are. Okay, so humans have the brains and technology to overcome our problems, but neither the will nor the institutions, which makes us, which makes Leo DiCaprio's latest movie more prophecy than satire. I can't attribute the quote. It was, I believe, in the comments section of 
one of your blog pieces and I noticed you have a comment section and you answer and it's really awesome. And uh, can we go a little bit into uh, your thoughts on that topic? Sure. Um, Well, I disagree with this statement um, right from the start. We I, technology is the problem and more technology is not going to solve technology, right? So the smarter and more techno, you know, a utopian we get, the further we got. And, um, you know, that is really one of the issues is that technology created agriculture or technology, you know, helped us figure out ways to use fossil fuels and technology is helping us do solar or, or uh, wind or all these things that are strip mining you know, lithium and cobalt and enslaving people. I mean, technology is creating a lot of issues for us. Um, And they're issues that are essentially the opposite of what an environmentalist would want, right? So, um, yeah, I I don't think we have the brains or the technology to solve our problems. I, I think we only have the brains and technology to create problems. Yeah. Well, that's why I thought that that was a good one to uh, to have, because I felt kind of the same way, you know, that, hey, we we our brains have done nothing but completely screw us up. And uh, I think, well, then let's segue. Let's segue into then what you call man's law. And uh, I'll just quickly read what I have. Every discussion of the future consequences of climate change must include a call for hope in man's law, a prediction that we can still do something meaningful, and a public assault on opposing views, particularly if those views involve expectations of irreversible, catastrophic, and existential threats to humanity. Um, And then, and this is what I have always said, I note that in the case of man, he also often includes a marketing for his books. And that is exactly uh, how we, uh, you know, a a lot of us see this. And in in fact, Rich Diana made the comment way before Michael Mann's pushing his new book, I Got Paid, Fuck You. (laughs) So we're, I mean, you know, we can laugh. We can laugh a little here because we all know what we're up against. So we can have humor. I mean, this is interesting that I just sort of came into this out of the blue. One of the very first posts I made under my new Twitter identity um, was on a Michael Mann, you know, to Michael Mann, and I got immediately blocked. So I I essentially posted one thing and was blocked. And um, so I made another Twitter post saying, hey, I was blocked by Michael Mann, and I just got this huge warm reception, you know, you must have done something good, welcome to the club, you know, now you're one of us type of thing. And I didn't know what that meant. I just thought, here is this world famous guy. And he's actually, I was, uh, yeah, well, when I was a professor at Ohio University, I was undergraduate chair and advisor for the pre-meteorology program. And in Mm -hmm. particular, um, I would always, all, all the people that were, um, I was advising wanted to go and study where Mike Mann is, right? They wanted, at that's the school to go to. So I know where he is and the status of his position and it's extraordinary. Um, and to me, it's just such a, a tragedy that a person who is that brilliant is, um, and, and even says things that a doomer would say. If you listen to him talk, you say, hey, that's what doomers are saying. You know, they are talking about the fact that the mathematical models are not keeping up with, with how fast things are really happening or how bad things are getting. He actually says stuff like that. I've watched his YouTubes, right? He will say doomer stuff and then still block doomers and call them worse than denialists. It, it's just... I don't yeah, know worse than how denial. a brain does. Yeah, how a brain does that, how the disconnect that you have to have in order to essentially block out, you know, intelligent, rational people who are looking at the same information and essentially saying the same things. Right? Yes. Yeah. You 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 really have a good point there. And and yet I, I guess he's turned into the he's turned into the corporatist sci- climate scientist. You know, he's well, the he's he, the go to guy for the for the talk shows, you know. Right. He likes the celebrity. I mean, I 
I would love to be a celebrity that was on the news shows every time they needed a, a, a climate doomer, right? Who, who's the go-to guy for being a doomer? Let's get Elliot. All right. Aww. So hey out there, you know, when, when you're done with Michael Mann and you want a real doomer, all right, I'll be your guy. You can put you can put professor before my name. That's what they want, right? They want the professor before their name. That always is like the key thing. So well, I'm okay. your man. CBS, Thank come you. calling. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, let, sorry, let's, I, uh, I'm shilling myself here. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Listen, this is we are very, um, very relaxed here, and uh, I, I, I want you to enjoy yourself so that you will come back again. Um, we have, um, we have a lot of people in the chat. Remember, guys, put a Q in front of any questions. So what we're going to do now is now that we we went through the whole uh, Michael Mann thing and the whole, uh, you know, background, let's talk about, let's go down to actual climate change. And you had done a video explaining a tweet that you had made on methane. And one of our followers, Nostradamus, David, I told you about earlier, I sent him your video and he was like, oh my God, we came to the same exact conclusions about this. And you do everything on a spreadsheet and, uh, and he does it all by hand. So can we talk about the methane calculations and your uh, views on what we're looking at? So Methane, um, you know, there's the raw numbers that is simply how much methane is in the atmosphere uh, and they come out each month and they're usually backdated about four or five months. And so the September numbers just came out. And for the first time ever, we broke through 1900 parts per billion, which was a, a target I, I thought we might get sometime this year, but we got it the, the first, you know, measurement out. So that kind of blew me away. I, I do these monthly calculations where essentially I'm trying to figure out exactly how much methane has gone into the atmosphere. Now, the naive thing to do is simply say, well, what was last month's measurement and what's this month's measurement? And the difference is how much has either gone in or gone out. Or mm -hmm. you could do a 12 month running average and say, you know, yes. this month compared to last year at the same time, and that will give you a yearly growth rate. And that's pretty much what you find on the Na on the uh, NOAA site is this sort of year over year, um, and we increase by fifteen point eight parts per billion, you know, year mm -hmm. over year. Um, but that doesn't take into account this really critical part of methane, which is what the people at COP twenty six and you know everybody is counting on, which is that methane decays very quickly from the atmosphere; it falls out of the atmosphere very quickly. So in a matter of eight, 10, 12 years, you've lost about half of the methane that gets put up there. So when you want to know how much methane is really going into the atmosphere, you have to take into account that from that 1900 that's in here this month, a certain amount of that has already decayed out. So that if we're higher than 1900 next month, we had to add in all of the amount that decayed to get back there, plus the new amount. Right. So we have to take into account decay. And so that's what my calculations do. They take into the fact that the more methane we have, the more bigger chunk of that is going to be decaying so that if we can get to there and even higher, it means a really huge amount of methane had to go in. So um, so we've been breaking records, you know, over and over and over again, the last three or four time, uh, times I've done this calculation, it's always a new record amount of methane. Um, is going into the atmosphere. And I'm not the only one to notice this. I mean, I mean, Zach, oh, Jennifer, you know, we you did know. a whole show on Zach Lab using Zach Lab's uh, graphs. And Jennifer, my partner, Jennifer Hines, is amazingly brilliant. You know, she yeah. is, uh, she's the, the perma, well, she calls it perma mush, perma mush and methane queen. So she is extremely, and that's why I think it would be great when you come back to have Jennifer with us. Yes, absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's happened then um, is that Zach, he put up, a, a po I put up a, tw a post on Twitter that used a four letter word when uh, methane went through 1900, because honestly, that's how I feel about it. And then Zach put up a post <sighs> saying it went through 1900. And his key word, if you ever see him say yikes in a post, you know, 
that's that means that's essentially his four yeah, letter his, word. Uh, his word fuck. It's okay. I told you this. Yeah, is, we're not yeah, okay, monetized. Thank you. Google's right. not going to take us off. We are. We're 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 we're, we're the real deal here. <laughs> yeah. <really> so. <laughs> So I've been on this quest to figure out where all this methane's coming from. And I'm convinced personally, it's not coming from the Arctic. I, I know a lot of people think, well, it must be, you know, the clathrates or the Siberian or whatever. I'm really convinced that's not it yet. It might be a small bit, of, a piece of it. But if you actually look at what's happening, um, I think there is a better answer for it. And, um, you know, I have my hypothesis. I'm willing to share it with you if you want, like my own speculation on on why these numbers are keep going up. There's there's some logic um, going on there, and I read this in in a research paper. Can I share it with you? I don't want to, you know. You can read. Sure, you can. Uh, and I'm, so, I'm just clicking a few comments. That's all. Okay. So um, essentially, because we're having La Nina, what that does is it creates a lot more equatorial rain. The, the rainfall patterns, you know, to get more rain in the, in the mid latitudes and the uh, equatorial region. And if you actually look at the sources of methane gas, the single largest source on the planet, right? The, if, if you sort of chop it up, uh, the pie up into where is the methane coming from? The single largest source is wetlands methane, the decay of wetlands. And um, so the mid latitude, the central latitude and equatorial regions, because we're getting more rain, we have more anaerobic decomposition and hence more methane from that region, right? And the problem is that this is the single source that we, there's absolutely no way we can control it. We can control, you know, cow flatulence. We could control, for example, rice methane. Um, to some extent, we can control fossil fuel methane, but mm -hmm. we can't control wetland, it raining, right? So essentially, we just haven't had enough El Ninos. There, there is a deficit of El Ninos compared to La Ninos. And the research actually suggests that uh, as climate change you know, progresses, we're going to see even fewer and weaker um, El Ninos. What about um, the clathrates? Well, that you very well could happen. That could happen tomorrow. I mean, it's just not the source yet. And, um, you know, mm. there's these there's these um, images you can get that show methane at various parts of the planet. And it shows mm -hmm, bright red sure. spots over, you know, oh, uh, we've showed them. <laughs> yeah, over Siberia and over the Arctic. Right. And I was I was putting those things up on my Twitter feed and mm -hmm. I got I got dinged by a climate scientist who said okay. that at those latitudes, they really cannot um, Re reliably use any image other than a full, the full um, column. So if you say what's ground level methane, and you just look at one of those things for ground level methane, essentially saying this, this is just guesswork. It's who knows, right? We don't, we don't look at those seriously. Um, he said, the only thing we can do, because, because they're looking down, right? Mm -hmm. Is we can just sort of say the total amount of methane we're encountering between, you know, going down to the ground. Uh -huh. So I, I just stopped posting those things. And now when I, there are some people who just regularly post those things on Twitter and I feel like I've been properly educated on it, but I don't want to get into a Twitter spat about those things. Right. No, um, Twitter is not worth it. Absolutely. Don't do that. So, I do have a but you know, I just have a, com a completely changed my mind. I think, I think this could happen this coming summer. Right. I think it may have already happened and we might see an explosion of methane numbers in the in the coming few months because of the fires and the methane they released and that hasn't yet, you know, shown up on these monthly okay. averages. But for right now, my money as a gambling man is on <laughs> Which the, you're not, really. <laughs> which I'm not. No. My gambling money is on wetlands and uh, okay. excessive rainfall. I have a question from Hunter. Hunter is our moderator from New Zealand. Hello, Hunter. Why so many sinkholes? Well, are there many? I know there are some. The Ask question Jennifer. is, what is what is many? Yeah. I mean, there are more than yeah, there used true. to be, and there is an increasing uh, increasing number. But okay. I mean, I think I think when the Siberian permafrost really lets loose, which it very well may do in the next couple of years, you know, hang on. Mm -hmm. um, the answer to that will be 
there aren't very many. You know, there are more than there were, and you know they are increasing. But this is going to be one of those nonlinear things where we're going to wake up, you know, someday, and there's going to be a hundred times as many. Uh, you know, when the whole uh, system just starts burping up methane like crazy, and that's going to be a very bad day, by the way. Well, the last show we did, uh, Jennifer and I did. I had asked her a question about the methane in Siberia and its effects on the indigenous population up there. And her answer to me was that it was not, um, it wasn't significant yet to be measured in a population of humans. I don't know if, you know, animals, we, I, I, but I, I, you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, I don't know how much methane you need. I know for CO2, there's some number like if it's 1,800 parts per million or something or okay. 900, you know, you start, it actually has cognitive impacts. I'm not sure whether there's a similar number for okay. methane or or not. Um, but I, I will say that um, as you go into the higher latitudes, the, the methane naturally, you know, increases. And that's just because um, it oxidizes um, when there's, so... A little chemistry. So, so the sun is beating down in the ocean. The ocean is creating lots of OHs. You know, it's it's extra hot around the equator. So there's more of these little hydroxyls. They're interacting with the methanes and and making the methanes go away, right? Okay. So, so that's happening. That's why there's the further you get away from direct sunshine, the more methane you're going to have, kind of just naturally. That's you know. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's go then on to the the next thing that I cooked up for, you know, for your brain tonight, and that was the uh, <laughs> the CO two question. And I had in, in watching your video and reading your material, um, I now you know I understand that there is that you know some people just throwing numbers around. Oh, we're already at two, you know. Then, just give us your idea of where we are with CO2. Um, have we even reached the 1.5 C mark yet? Uh, you know, go for it. Um, okay. I just, this is my best description of where we are with CO2. We're, we're totally fucked. All right. That's where we are with CO2. There we are. We are, okay. we, we are, we are at that. This is the, the totally fucked line for CO2. We're like, like right here. Okay. okay. Well, thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> thank you for the gong. I appreciate yeah. it very much. Oh, you didn't get the toilet flush yet. <laughs> okay. <Can> we... <laughs> um, but, you know, all that means is that all the feedback loops are in place and there's no going yeah. back. I mean, this is this is a done deal. And, you know, scary. Four, 420, Actually. you know, 350 in many ways was the last um, stopping point where feedback loops wouldn't have naturally taken over and done their own part, you know. And if we had managed to stop at 360, you know, maybe it would have taken 100, 150 years for everything to kind of play out, you know. But at 420, we're looking at, I don't know. I mean, I don't like to make predictions, but collapse is already happening all over the planet, right? Collapse. Yes. Um, and it's happening with governments. It's happening um with with ecosystems is happening with climate conditions you know it's happening with, with lethal wet bulb temperatures we are seeing collapse happen everywhere so so the question is how long until collapse happens everywhere right and <sighs> that's you know that's a number you don't want to go guessing because it's it just feels kind of random and arbitrary um but my that person who was a guest on my show you know when she said 15 years i now that I look at it, I it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, that that things won't be essentially um, impossible in 15 years on impossible. the planet. It's, it's um, pretty scary, you know, but we've dealt with it. So did you want me to talk about two degrees C? Yes, to, I do. Just, Segue right over there. OK, we'll be real smooth about this. Be real smooth about it. <laughs> real smooth. So. Um, you know, we have measured very concretely 1.21 degrees C rise from the 1850 to 1900 uh, bench line. That's the documented rise. And then there's a whole bunch of research papers that try and sort of track that back um, some amount of period before that. 
And, you know, we, the problem is that um, we don't really have very good models for what the climate was like. I mean, we can make approximations, but we weren't really keeping global temperatures and trying to figure out things in a very accurate way. So anything before that is, is kind of educated guesswork. And the best estimates that I've seen from about 1750 to 1850 give us um, at most 0.2 to 0.3 degrees C rise in that period of time. And I know there are people out there who say, no, you're mistaken, this or that. I've, I have an article I, I, or a, a, a video I made about this. I've, I've cited source after source, right? I've went looking for the research papers. And if you actually look at the CO2 and GHG gases that went in the atmosphere from 1750 to 1850, not that much. And to think that, you know, somehow we got 0.8 degrees C rise out of that little bit of GHG is kind of an absurdity. I think I think the smell test says that we're probably from 1750 in the 1.4 to 1.5 range, right? Right. Um, but you know when yeah. when the the um, IPCC bases things on 1850 to 1900, and all their statements about the future are about those numbers. And then someone says, oh, yeah, well, we're already 1.5 based on 1750. Therefore, all those things have already happened. Well, that's disingenuous because if the IPCC wanted to base it on 1750, then they would have said 1.8 was the target, right? Oh. So, so, oh. yeah. so whenever, whenever you hear people sort of say, well, we already have 1.5 warming. So, you know, the world's already going to come to an end. Well, it is already going to come to an end, but we don't Eventually. have that much. Yeah, we don't have pretty soon, but we don't have that much. <laughs> we don't have that much warming. We just don't. And, you know, if you actually talk about like, what does it mean to um, um, take a baseline? You never take a single year as a baseline anyway. Um, okay. So you can't talk about the 1750 baseline. That's a single year. Maybe it was a cold year, right? Um, and um, it was in the middle of what's called the mini ice age. So if you look at historical temperatures, you know, from about um, uh, 1200 through 1600, somewhere in that range, temperatures averaged, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, from about 1300 to 1800, temperatures averaged about a half a degree C lower than before that period of time. So you're choosing sort of an artificial low point. And even okay. if you're at that artificial low point, it doesn't, um, you can't get past 1.5, even using the artificial low point. So anyway, that's my little spiel on that. Well, that was interesting. Um, because there is, you know, there are some people that do just, you know, banty about numbers sort of arbitrarily without going what i do the, professionally yeah oh, you oh. are the number guy the numbers guy yeah. the numbers guy yeah boy everybody's out there in the chat uh is, don't play is, blackjack uh, oh i have a book on blackjack too <laughs> yeah that's another thing i've saw some comments out there about can you teach them how to cheat <laughs> we want to um, learn how to cheat yeah but so show us so that's my that's my <gasps> blackjack book that. you can actually get that book for free on my um my gambling website, I just put the PDF up there for free if anybody wants okay. to read my Blackjack book. You gamblers out there. You know, we're all gamblers. Our whole system is based on gambling. We are one big, like Paul says, climate casino, but we are one big capitalist casino of gambling. That's what our systems are all around the world, in my opinion. We are just one huge gamble all the time. That's that's what every human system has ever been based on but okay it's not my show it's yours so we're going to move on and uh what i i, I kind of th uh, thought also what i found interesting was your conversation about aerosols and about the transition to green energy and what your thoughts are on that whole subject you know transitioning off fossil fuels let's get off them everybody wants to get off them Boom. Well, what well do you think? I'm, I, I, I think you probably have discussed this topic a few times before, but um, obviously the, uh, the aerosol uh, masking effect, you know, which um, global dimming is a real thing. Um, and 
there is some argument that part of the recent rise already in global temperatures is due to these cleaner fuels that that have been used. The, the, you know, we don't have as much sulfur um, going this uh, sulfate aer aerosols in the atmosphere as we used to, and so we're getting um, you know more direct solar radiation. So I think that's definitely an issue. And um, yeah, anybody who says um, I'm just going to call it my latest thing is the tyranny of we, all right? That's my phrase, the tyranny of we. I'm thinking of a blog article with that name, but we have to get off fossil fuels would be an example, right? I say we need, Yeah, we need to stop using fossil fuels. We need to um, convert to green energy. We need to all drive Teslas. We need solar. We need, you know, wind. We need, um, whenever I hear the word we like that, um, I always like, like, no, there's something wrong with that right away. That, that just the fact that it's a, we need to, for me means no way that will never happen. It's not a solution anyway. Um, and when, did you put on a, a, a vote, a thing? Of <laughs> well, okay. We're not getting off. Uh, we have to get off fossil fuels, but we're not. Um, well, yeah, we have to get off fossil <laughs> yeah. fuels. 30 years ago, we had to, yes. Yeah, um, I now think my if, chat would agree. Now, if we did it, we're just going to burn ourselves up. Uh, you know, we'll just fry. Um, and it'll just be, you know, it rather than being possibly years, it would be months, right? If if everybody stopped driving their cars and or somehow we managed to um, get rid of them. Yeah, the aerosol masking effect is real. It's about half a degree C. Um, I think that there are some people who think it's a lot more than that. If you look at the IPCC report, it puts that at about 0.6 C, but then they have an error bar that goes up to about 0.9 C, I think, in, in the report. So it's not a huge effect, but if you go warming the whole planet by half a degree C in a very short period of time, you know, that that is doomed. There, there's no question about it. That amount of energy entering the atmosphere is just is mind boggling how much that is. And uh, yeah, essentially crops would fail. Um, there'd be flooding rains. Uh, you know, we'd get huge sea level rise because things would melt extraordinarily fast. We'd have wet bulb temperatures off the scale, you know, in the equatorial region. So yeah, um, stop using fossil fuels is, is a quick death. Okay, so how do you counter when somebody like Peter Kalmus, who have I, I've had as a guest and is adamantly screaming about, not screaming, but, you know, he wants to get off fossil fuels. We have to get off fossil fuels. We have to make the, uh, the transition. And he's convinced, and he's a NASA he, uh, you know, climate jet, he works in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I, I know you see him. How do you counter with your thoughts here on the uh, aerosol masking effect? So I have, uh, I'm a big fan of his. Um, one of the reasons I really like him is he is one of the very few climate scientists who is just speaks his mind, right? Who just really tells it how it is, how bad it is. Um, so given the, um, the way he is willing to put himself on the line with these things in a public way, you know, I just have admiration for the man. Um, I, I think you have to, um, if you're going to have hopium, right, if you're going to be an apocaloptimist, then that means you have to have a solution in mind. And, and without a solution, you can't do that. Uh, you know, I'm, there is no solution, but if you're going to choose a solution, many, many people say, stop fossil fuels right of course it's an impossibility it will never happen it's you know it won't happen people will be um using fossil fuels till the last um you know human uh dies on this planet it's just they're here it's that's human nature so i mean i'm i'm sorry that um that he's kind of taken that you know choice to um not deeply examine the reality, the human reality of doing that, that that, that is something that won't happen. It's not something, you know, it, it will not happen. It's against human nature to not use a resource that provides energy. You know, the more 
green energy we provide, the more solar, the more wind, the more thermal, whatever it is, that's just adds to the energy pile. It doesn't take away from the fact that we're using fossil fuels, right? People right. just use all the energy we create. So, you know, when you say we need more wind, solar and all this other stuff to stop fossil fuels, no, we will we'll create all this uh, extra energy and we'll use it to build more efficient farms and clear cut more forests. And we'll use it to, um, you know, mine more lithium and we'll, we'll use it to create even more energy. Right. If we need to, we'll use the energy for that. We'll use it to make ourselves wealthier, you know, and borrow against the future. We even can't, a help bit more. can't help ourselves. Can't help ourselves that's human nature right so so yeah i think i think the the flaw is thinking that there's some way that we can substitute x for y because um you know in order to get off fossil fuel you need this other thing that'll never happen so I wow i i wonder if um P uh, peter has read derek jensen's book bright green lies I wonder, you know, I wouldn't want to get him mad at me, but I kind of want to send it to him just to or, give him or, another perspective. Or Planet of the Humans. I mean, it's another, you know, just on uh, YouTube yeah. for free. So that's that's oh, a sure. similar um, argument. We did a lot of talking about that movie. And, and most of my, you know, chat, our channel, people loved it. You know, we also a lot of us liked uh, the Don't Look Up. You know, that was, a, it, it, it was, um, it made me cry. You know, I, of course I, I just cried everything, but it made me feel something. I felt that how futile, you know, our systems are and that I've known. And so a lot of us know, but you know, as you are a grandfather and I am a mother of a 33 year old and a lot of us are, what do you tell the kids? What do you say to the kids? So I've had this conversation with my older son, who is now 42, um, several times over the years. I mean, dating back a decade, I'm sure. And um, he is in, both of my kids are in the solar. And my um, older son actually works at a very high level um, getting solar for entire cities. Like, a, you know, an entire city wants to go solar. His company would be the one that would take a contract like that. Um, and so he has kids. And so it's sort of like if you have children, right, young children, there's something, again, biological that almost prevents you from seeing this truth, seeing this reality. And okay. as a, you know, as a grandparent, I don't want to push, push it. I'll just, you know, but this last time when I saw him, when he visited, it started, he, he started getting it you know, and uh, expressing okay. things to me that really surprised me, you know, sort of like, yeah, now he now he's really getting it, you know, like um, looking for property, you know, in locations that are going to be more rural and, you know, have larger land available, and, um, you know, places that will have adequate supplies of water going into the future and all these other the things. The privileged you know, which, position that not you know, billions are not, not very few have yeah. very few have the, that. Yeah. But right now, these there are these massive migrations taking place in our country. I mean, you know, we are losing huge amounts of people from uh, climate, you know, I mean, essentially, California is being vacated, you know, in yeah, they're moving time. to Boise, <laughs> Texas, Boise and Texas. Texas. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Well, I do have a question here. And this one is from Jack. And I hope, Jack, you're still here. Because uh, I think it's it's a important question to ask you. Um, Jack is saying, well, this is why we need climate geoengineering by the UN, possibly now. And I'm, you know, I, to extrapolate a little bit more on that, that's what what's his name is doing at Harvard. Um the Mirror Reflection Project. Well, that's a different one. That's Mirror, but I'm talking about David Keith, who's doing the, the other geoengineering studies on the solar, you know, the the the, the conspiracy of chemtrails. But w what are your uh -huh. thoughts? Can you give us your thoughts on the geoengineering projects that are out there? I'd be, be fascinated to hear. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, of ideas that, you know, may have merit putting, um, I think, is it iron into the ocean to increase the algae or, or 
um, you know, cloud brightening or um, the mirror reflection or space mirrors or, you know, there, there are lots of different projects out there. Um, so I think the way you can tell that that's hopeless is that they're, they never make it into a political leader speech um, of any country anywhere on the planet. They never make it to the floor of the Senate or the House in this country. You never hear discussion about it, you know, in your own by your own governor or, you know, essentially there's not the political will um, that there would need to be to make such a project happen. Um, you know, you're talking about a trillion dollar um, global investment, probably a multi-trillion dollar. And people are hungry and starving right now all over the planet. And as climate change gets worse, that hunger is just going to get worse and the, the extra money is not going to be there. So, you know, you can make a commitment today as a country that you wouldn't live up to next year because things have gotten bad that quickly. There just is not the international willpower to... And then there's the other problem. I mean, which one would work? Which one would not have some consequence that, you know, we didn't count on? You only get one chance at geoengineering, right? We could end up making it so much worse by choosing the wrong one, right? By injecting some um, silver way up in the atmosphere to reflect, you know, and then all of a sudden we have some uh, chemical reaction with ozone or something, and now we're all frying. You know, it's just mm. uh, the the technical issues for what it could possibly do to us together with the lack of international political will. I just think, you know, none of those things will ever happen. None of them. You really don't think so? So Paul Beckwith, Patrick McNulty has a his project is called Ohm Tech, and uh, Dave, that does just have a think, he has a whole show on Ohm Tech, and I've interviewed Patrick, and Patrick's Ohm Tech has to do with the Gulf, has to do with, you know, so it would be interesting for you to possibly, I'll send you the link to the just have a think, but what do you think, uh, oh, I lost it. Okay, Patrick's question was, um, Beckwith wants to spray sulfur dioxide in the Arctic to stop warming. Need to do that when fossil fuels are no longer being burned. Do you have a, uh, a thought about that for Patrick? Uh, well, uh, anything you, that Patrick. Paul Beckwith, anything Paul Beckwith says, I have to agree with. I mean, I just, I, I adore the man. It very well could work. Again, if there's the political willpower and the money available, which there isn't, right? So, no. um, so yeah, if, if Paul came up with a solution, I'm sure he knows the chemistry and he's done the analysis. And I, I haven't thought about that particular uh, solution before. But yeah, I mean, there are so many um, ideas out there. And again, what you hear a lot is this tyranny of we. If only we could spray sulfur dioxide particles in the Arctic you know, then we would be able to go on um, consuming more and over, you know, more overshoot and more energy. And yeah, mm -hmm. if only we could put some iron into the ocean, then we can produce, then we can use more fossil fuels. So, I mean, environmentalism has really totally lost its way. I, it, it is completely lost because we, we think that owning a Tesla and having a battery backup solar system you know, on your house is now being an environmentalist. It is absolutely has nothing to do with environmentalism. I mean, environmentalism is getting down to a creek and picking up the litter, right? And environmentalism yeah. is going to an oil spill and cleaning yeah. animals that have been, you know, environmentalism is lobbying for the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act or the Doing the beautiful you know, things, uh, yeah. So, but those things, you know, have been replaced by materialism, right? They've been replaced by this, this um, almost salesman-esque, you know, buy this thing and save the planet. You know, if only you you spent your money on this thing that requires child labor and slavery, right. you know, to mine the, you know, then we'll save the planet. You know, it, it's it's the opposite of um, of goodwill. You know, it's the opposite of environmentalism. Okay. Well, here's a, a very interesting question. This is about MMT and hello, MC Green. MMT, modern monetary theory. Okay. It's economics. It's how we actually do our money. You know how the, the federal government taxes are, uh, federal taxes don't fund spending. MMT says we can't run out of money. The trillions are available. Why not spend some on climate? 
Well, Why what not? a good idea. Yeah, good idea. But um, how do we get the political will? No, I mean, I, I disagree with that statement. I, 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 I hate to disagree with modern monetary theory because I am not an economist. Um, okay. But essentially, this is this is the shell game we've been playing in this country since 2008 with the Fed just printing money, you know, and, and increasing the balance sheet by trillions and trillions of dollars, you know, essentially with having zero percent interest rates and uh, having the stock market, you know, sort of to record height. So, yeah, the wealthy are getting really rich on just printing money. You know what happens at the end of that? Because mm -hmm. it's a bubble, you know, every bubble bursts and, um, you know, people especially think that they have the new idea for a bubble, whether it's Bitcoin or just print money, you know, uh, or quantitative easing. All these things, uh, they're illusions and they've been going on for far too long. Um, and, you know, we will be really lucky to get through 2022 without a huge market crash, just just an off the charts market crash. So. You think that's um, you know, coming, these, huh? these trillions of dollars, you know, let's, let's print them, but you know, they're going to get wiped out by inflation anyway, because, you know, you devalue, you can't, you cannot create, um, natural resources by printing them, right? You cannot print more oil, you know, you can't yeah. print more wind. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it doesn't okay. exist in some sense, you know? So that's my completely ignorant response to that really good question. Well, it's not ignorant. It's it's, it's a response. Well, and here's another. I just one. don't this know. Is... I just I just don't know anything about <laughs> economics, well, and so that's and that's you know. honest. And MMT, you know, I I, I dribble in and out with um, a lot of my uh, friends are um, in in the MMT world, and so I really wanted to make sure I I brought that up. And Scott. Scott is uh, asking if only we could solve this overpopulation issue. You know, somebody's always going to talk about that. And, you know, uh, I would like to get your thoughts on, uh, is it a problem? How do you solve it? Of course, we're not talking about mass genocide or anything like that. Of course, we're not. But really, what are we talking about here? Well, I'm, I'm sure you know the carrying capacity of the planet is what about a billion people, something like that. So, According to Catton, I, William Catton. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so we have about an extra seven billion people on the planet right now, and I mean, collapse is how we solve it, right? It it will take care of itself, um, and and probably fairly short order. I mean, it's on the scale of a single human lifetime or less that problem will take care of itself. So, yeah, I mean, overpopulation is the issue, right? That's that's the only issue in many ways. But I mean, overpopulation was inevitable. It didn't matter whether we uh, developed agriculture and fossil fuels or whatever. I mean, it's just sort of the natural um, predator prey cycles, right? When I was a computer science professor, I used to say, well, we have foxes and chickens and there's certain equations like they're, they're that say, you know, when there's more chickens, the fox population goes up because they have more food, but then there's too many foxes, you know, they eat all the chickens and so they all starve and they go on and this. So there, there's, you know, oscillating curves and we humans are subject to that just as much as the foxes and the chickens. Um, so, you know, we're on, we're on the curve that's way above the food that the planet can provide right now. And, and, you know, collapse happens a lot faster. I don't know if you've seen these graphs where, you know, the the rise is kind of slow and gradual, this exponential rise, but the collapse is very fast of the population once you hit that that uh, point. That was a comment I, I put up there. It was a, a little bit of uh, uh the solution to climate change is, well, it's easy. Sorry, but I'm not typing a thousand pages. You just need hope. You know, I can retrace my thoughts. Musk. <laughs> Yeah. Good old okay. Elon. <laughs> I, I, I love that. Is that yeah. actually an Elon Musk quote? I don't think so. I, was, I think I, our Jerome. I, you know what, Jerome? We're going to give Elon Musk the environmental ha coffee house flush of the day. Yay. Flush that right away. That's our flush. If you get the flush, well, you're doing something wrong usually. <laughs> we want to get rid of well, it. Well, you know, on your show, it, it's interesting for me because I, I – have been aware you've been doing this show for a while, right? And that you uh, have spectacular, wow. 
<laughs> yeah, and you've had spectacular guests on here. And I'm so new to this business and I am so opinionated, right? So um, I always wonder, it's like, like I say these things and I go, hmm, and then I'll get a correction and I'm really quick at learning and doing the research if I ever get corrected. So, um, you know, I'm going to look at the chat after this and if somebody has a correction for me, put it down there somewhere. I'm looking forward yeah, to reading that. Absolutely. And you know what? I, I That's what I noticed about you is that you will take uh, a, a, a constructive criticism and you will look at the question. I noticed that by reading your blog. I noticed that by your Twitter tweets. I'm the same way. I did a whole damn show just because one person said I was the meathead. I mean, it was a joke, but you know, oh, it's, it, it's a, it was about humor and laughter yeah. when we're yeah. talking about these critically serious subjects. And, you know, somebody had made the comment, well, can you, how can you and Jennifer have the banter you have when you're presenting this. And I did a whole show on how uh, laughter and humor in presenting climate change and climate change communication is essential. It's essential. Hey, we have a really important question. Elliot, are you vegan? No. And why not? Or why um, would you want to be or why would you not want to be just that's and not to put you on the spot because a lot of us are not I am a vegetarian I am a uh, a converting person, you know, but there's a lot of us that are and a lot of us that aren't so go for it. So I um, was a vegetarian for much of my life. Um, I'm not a vegetarian now I um try so so i'm not much of a cook and my wife is a fabulous cook so our menu is what she wants to cook and i try and encourage like today i made a nice pot of rice and i had rice and tofu um you know for lunch with some uh tomato slices and, and avocado slices does that i think but I use I use butter to saute the rice. So, okay. Okay. Well, you know that I so, get the veganism. I mean, I use butter. I use eggs. But there's right. a lot. I don't buy factory farm meat. I live in the rural country. I will buy my eggs from my neighbor. I don't have chickens yet. I have. So I, I want chickens. <laughs> so yeah, I try and yeah. encourage my wife as much as possible. You know, in terms of our menu for the sort of my preference. But you know, she has her own preference and. We're not going to have separate diets. So if she cooks okay. something, I'll, you know, I'll eat it. You'll eat it because you're a good husband. <laughs> You'll eat it. <laughs> and she's a really good cook, too. Well, thank you for answering that. I didn't want to put um... <laughs> Jim says, I thought you weren't allowed in California if you're unless you're a vegetarian. <laughs> Yeah, no, we do oh, have we rules have in chat. California. No, no, you have to believe in <laughs> karma and reincarnation and you have to, um, you know, know everything about your astrological sign. Oh, you got to do that. Yeah, you got to do. Actually, I wanted to play this one. This is California. Woo, that's California. We have a lot of twinklies out here. Yeah, that's so, California. So, Max yes. is from California. Hello, Max. He's, he says we cannot pollute ourselves out of the situation by using more fossil fuels. No, we can't. <laughs> we can't. So, oh, Kevin Hester's here. Uh, hi, hi, Kevin. Kevin. Let's see. Kevin says, Elliot is the real deal. He's a valuable member of our community facing this predicament. That is a very good compliment from Kevin. He is definitely um, a he's very a awesome. Yeah, he's an awesome person. <laughs> Jennifer's been there yes. to spend time in New Zealand with Kevin. He's amazing. I've had him as a guest a long time ago, Kevin. It's time for you to come back. Uh, definitely. Um, I, I think Kevin is, um, and I interact quite a bit on um, Twitter and uh, it's always lively. I, I think that um, he's very respectful. We don't necessarily agree on everything um, between us about these things, but I, I think it's really great when uh, people can have genuine disagreements about sort of the, the very intricate little facts and details of how things fit together and say, well, that doesn't really matter in the scheme of things because the big problems are so much bigger than those details. So we disagree on some details, but we're a hundred percent, you know, best buddies with this is bad. Well, maybe Kevin and you can have that conversation on his show. Yeah. Why not? 
I'm sure you'll make the circuit now. <laughs> oh, is that how oh, it goes? Yeah, the circuit. Oh, hi, future ghost. For another New Zealander. Very popular. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, since we are now at a the question answer time, we are an hour and four minutes. This went fast. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, uh, let's go back and see if I could make sure I don't miss anything from the beginning. Uh, okay, if, okay, here's one. An, another from MC Green. Question, if by accident there's a 0 0.5 C plus cooling, why not do one C more on purpose and then buy time to draw down? Now that's uh, buy time to draw down. I'm not sure I understand that one. So if by accident there's one, you mean we go up? I don't know. I if you're know. still here, MC, help us with that one, okay? I don't know if, if that was, I don't know how to answer it, but, or I, I don't know if Elliot knows how to answer it. I, uh, I don't know how we by accident have half a degree C cooling. I mean, um, you know, I obsess over numbers. And so I am on the CAM, C-A-M-S, you know, website every day looking at the global averages, you know, against various uh, timelines. And we're always hotter than, you know, the, the, even the 1990 to 220, 2020 averages were always above that, right? We're always hotter than whatever the previous benchmark was. So yeah, going back half a degree, that's not happening in the next million years. I mean, just okay. absolutely not happening. Okay. Now let me see. I think I had uh, this. Um, oh, well, Gene wants to know, how much longer do you think U.S. citizens will have daily accident to factory grown animal accident. flesh? Oh, look at that. <laughs> I hope not very much longer. I hope I, not I, either. I, I think it's disgusting, personally. I'm, I, I can live on rice and tofu and a few veggies. Uh, I, I did for many years uh, as a vegetarian. Oh, um, so, so I'm, I, I'm <laughs> just absolutely fine with it, you know. If, but as long as it's available, my wife is going to be buying it and cooking it for us. So we'll be eating it. All right. Jack, he meant about the point five. He meant draw down fossil fuels. LOL, you fools. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. I think I know Jack. I know Jack. So is that, can we go back? It was to that, to the what we were talking about it's the i don't know the masking effect from pollution is around 0.5 oh, yes it is yes so i'm not sure what the question is now all right i have to find it it's probably i don't know if i can get it again oh darn i'm so sorry i did this guys i didn't want to confuse anybody and i'm i mean i mean I essentially what we need to do is we need to um make um fossil fuels much dirtier right so we need to do away with the the Clean Air Act and um, all of the improvements in car exhaust and just generate really dirty exhaust from mm. automobiles. That would probably uh, buy us a few years. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't work for the fossil fuel industry. Are you a plant? Well, I'm Did just saying. Did they plant I mean, you into the doomosphere? Elliot, tell us the truth. Look, I got them all red. Okay, which company? Shell, uh, no. are you really Norwegian? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. All right, I mean, all right. just just evil, evil, evil corporations and people, just unbelievably evil that they, they really do this are to our planet. I mean, just I think of the Koch brothers, or I think of Philip Morris and tobacco, or you know the uh, what happened with the. Um, Oh, the pills, you know, that people were taking for pain pills, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but but these people are so beyond evil, what they did to this planet. And, and I mean, I just I don't even know it, it's it's so visceral for me. You know, it's like it's like one of those five stages of, of grief, you know, where uh, after death, mm -hmm. right, that mm -hmm. that anger. And sometimes it comes up. And, and I just have to breathe through it because it just doesn't matter anymore. Honestly, it doesn't yes. matter. It's, it's done, but I'm still pissed, right? I'm so angry. Well, sure. We all have a sense of anger, but we all try to deal with it with, well, you know, as long as we have online with community like this, there are other communities, Kevin's community. Um, this is how we've really 
we've tried to to do for us, you know, for us. Um, uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, Wadhams is correct, Patrick said, going all the way back to uh, the theory. I, I think the theory on Paul, what Paul's advocating for the um, in the Arctic, the Arctic spray. And lightning rod, ask Elliot, climate change is uh, Tursla's only threat. <laughs> Tursla. I have a bunch of comedians here. Climate change, Tesla. Is it Tesla's only threat? Climate change. Oh. Uh, I don't understand the question. Okay. I think he was making a joke about, okay. you know, it's, Tesla. That was, about that was... it, 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 Climate change is Tesla's threat threat like tesla will go away because our climate change is you know climate change oh, is so I, far I see in other words elon Am I interpreting the question right? is what's going to happen first is elon musk going to take over the world or is, is civilization going to collapse right uh -huh. <laughs> that's uh -huh. the basic okay. question all right all right all right um let's see uh ch -ch 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 -ch. um climate marcher john Oh, so I teach kids math, science from middle school to high school and some college students. What do I tell them? This truth hurts and I'm at a loss sometimes. And I saw on your, you had one of, uh, I, I don't know if it was on Twitter or where it was, one of your former students found you and read your stuff and said, came back and asked you the same thing, said, I am now understanding. He said he was just going along life, thinking he had time, found you, knew you, you were, he was in your class. What do you say to that one? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. This is, this is just such a uh, profoundly sad moment in life, right? To, essentially have it be the end of everything. It's the end of legacy, right? It's the, it's the end of all of art and science and mathematics and everything, you know, beautiful and spectacular, artistic and dance and that, that humanity has created. This is the end of everything. Um, and we're, we're either blessed because we happen to be the generation who gets to see that or, or we're cursed because for the generation that gets to see that, right? So um, as I wrote, um, the loss of everything means the loss of everything, the loss of everything. And um, that just hurts. It hurts in a way that that I I think it was a George Monbio, is that his mm -hmm. name? The George English- George Monbiot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he started crying on that UK, um, show there was a television interview show where they yeah, essentially asked right. them how do you explain this to your grandkids and he just mm -hmm. broke down in tears right he just absolutely and i feel i i just love that man and i just feel the same way i mean how can you do anything but break down in tears at the prospect of answering a question like that right you know right right and K, uh, Kamishwari Kate is one of our mods, and she said she she was talking to Ka, uh, Tanya, saying, "I never thought I would appreciate small scale regenerative farming, and we all do. I, I mean, I grow, and uh, we had a gentleman here with us earlier. That let me see, I, I don't know if he's still here. Who has? Oh, Rick Larson. Uh, what did his question was? Have you done calculations with how much carbon forests can sequester? Are you acquainted with uh, Anastasia?" Uh, uh, Macariva and Rick is a permaculture absolute expert on permaculture did it throughout his property in northern Michigan I believe it is that's the question right. anything about so, that yeah I think they address that in bright green lies um, the, the problem is forests just don't grow very fast right so you know and they're burning down anyway because you know yeah, we, maybe we'll plant a forest in location X, but twice as much of that is burning down in location Y. So you'll never catch up by planting. There's no harm in planting trees, right? But mm -hmm. you'll never catch up. I think I think there's some statistic like we would need to plant trees on 70% of all arable farmland to be able to um, sequester the, you know, enough carbon, enough CO2 out of the atmosphere to stop you know, runaway global 
uh, climate change. And, you know, when you hear about the actual amount of trees you would need and the fact that it would take 50 years to get those trees to a, you know, or 30, if it's Monterey pine, I don't know. Um, it's still, a, it's a huge scope of time that we don't have and forests are burning down at the same time. So yeah, I, I, again, I think that would have been a brilliant idea 30 years ago. That's, we should have done that 30 years ago. <sighs> right? Rick said uh, regenerative ag has already been taken over by agribusiness, a prop for fuel burning civilization. Humans have to go back to peasant culture. That's how, he, I mean, and he, and he has shown it on his channel, how you can live simply, but it's not as simple as even how he shows it, you know, none of us, it seems like can reach that because we have, we live, we don't live in, in, I have an outhouse on my property, but I mean, I don't live that way. Yeah. You're not going to um, somehow take 8 billion people and, and no. find each one of them 14 acres of farmable land in mm -hmm. order to, you know, have enough land to, to create a, a self-sustaining, you know, farm for themselves and their family. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, we're so far beyond that with, with overshoot and overpopulation. Yeah, those people who are blessed to have land that they can do that, that's great. And, you know, that land is precious now. Um, so good. It's, it's great that you're doing that. And, um, you know, more power to you. But it's just, it's not, are... it's just not a viable solution to save the planet from what's coming in any respect. Oh. It's a tough, it's tough. I mean, this has been, it's, it's, it's been a, an enjoyable conversation. Uh, we're already at like an hour and 16 minutes. This has been really great. We've got 108 people with us. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I've appreciate this, uh, appreciated this. And I know we have even more in the chat. If you want to go, um, uh, Jack says, um, how about, how about how about give me about five more about five more minutes? All right. All right. Because yeah, I'm I'm turning into toast here. <laughs> so okay. I'm, well, I'm let's gonna just be done in this... about five minutes. Okay. The, you know what? Let me see if there's any more. Uh, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Well, there's so many. <laughs> there's just so many. I mean, we have like five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> okay, here's a serious one. How do you beat the climate casino? <laughs> I actually oh, have an article God. about that on my blog. They'll just have to look right. it up. I mean, I I just love um, I love Paul Beckwith, and he uses climate casino saying that um, in some sense um, you never know what's going to hit next or where it's going to hit. Right. So it's just a completely random sort of Thing that's going to happen you know we're going to get floods here we're going to get you know and and michael mann makes that point too he says that the models are not sufficient to predict or keep up with what's actually happening in some way he is a doomer he just is de in denial of the fact or maybe he realizes it just doesn't sell um but yeah so the climate casino in casinos there's some winners right nobody would go to a casino unless they could win sometime um so the whole point of casinos, going to casinos, is this excitement that maybe today is my lucky day. The problem is that nothing about climate change is ever good. None of this is good. None of this is like, oh, I'm so happy we had a flood because we, you know, here in California, I'm so glad we had a flood because we had a drought last year. Well, yeah, now we had a flood and the roads are washed out and you know, we had 30 people die in Montecito four years ago when they had the mudslides here right after we had a fire, but we needed the rain, right? So I think the problem with the analogy of a casino for climate is that that with climate change, it's, it's just all bad news, right? And, and we call it climate uh, disruption, by the way. <laughs> and you're, Yeah, you're never going to hit a jackpot, right? You're never going to have yeah. a lucky day. It's just, it's just all bad. So wow. that's my answer. Yeah. How about, how about, uh, yeah. So I could teach you how to win in a real casino, which is not a, well, you know, not a climate that, casino. I think a good way then to end would be to ask you this last question from Gene. What does Elliot do to soothe his mind about all this? How do you cope? How well, do you cope? 
I have a couple of passions. I, I like to hike. I go walking a lot. So if you actually look at my Twitter bio, it says Planet mm -hmm. Walker. Mm -hmm. So I am an avid, avid walker. Um, and I, I will typically just put on music while I'm doing that and just sort of get into this whole Zen place. And the other thing is I'm a musician, so I, I will just play music. Uh -huh. So um, I've, you know, recently been playing a lot of Irish music on the fiddle. So learning a lot of Irish tunes and uh, yeah, just the, it's just really nice to get into that kind of different part of your brain and, and hang out there. Um, so I guess that would be the answer to that question. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, I'm playing some ending music. I want to thank everyone in the chat. This was, uh, I, I very much enjoyed having you, Elliot, as my guest. And guys, don't forget that if you like the content, I'm doing my little thing here. If you like the content, don't forget to become a member of our Buy Me a Coffee. I will never monetize on YouTube. Forget it. And uh, uh, Elliot, Thank you so very much, everybody. There's just too many of you for me to say your names like usual, but you know who you are. You know how much we love you. Thank you so much, Elliot. You want to say anything? Well, thank you, Sandy. So this is my first one of these. Like you say, uh, maybe people will invite me on things. I'm happy to do it. But thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. I have just had a tremendous uh, you know, respect for you and what you do here. And thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. See you Sunday. I will be live with Jennifer, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay? Peace out. Want to stay in?